Welcome to the Invested Teacher Podcast with Kyle Pierce, Matt Bigley, and John Orr. Get ready to be taught as we share our successes and failures encountered during our real life lessons learning how to build generational wealth from the ground up. Welcome, Invested students. Hey, that's you. Uh, to another episode of the Invested Teacher Podcast. Let's go! All righty, my friends. We are going to dive straight in here. Uh, and we're going to start mm-hmm. checking ourselves uh, around this idea, this fad, this social media phenomenon that want that everybody wants to dig into. And that is flipping homes and properties. And uh, we're saying here at Invested Teacher anyway, we're saying no flipping way oh, uh, because... That's bold. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've been there. We've done that. And uh, today we're going to build a case for why flipping is not in our personal preference. Uh, again, we're not going to say we'll right. never do flips because guess what? Hey, we're currently doing one yeah. right now, <laughs> we, but uh, guess what? I was Once again, say, we're, we're doing one with, this is maybe the reason we're bringing this up on the podcast is because yeah, we don't yeah. want to do anymore. Now you said fad, Kyle. I, I, you know, fad sounds like it's been, you know, it's, it's, it's here and then it's gone. I don't know. Like, I think, I think this, kind of method of investing and and turning a profit or loss uh, is is here to stay. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a fad, but uh, I think I think ironing out the details uh, of what you are looking for and how it's going to work for you or not you. And I think like you say, Cal, we're going to build a case of why we aren't going to do another flip. Uh, But Matt, fill us in on some details uh, on uh, on maybe why we won't want to do any of this anymore. You know, I'm just I'm just picturing the HGTV show titles, you know, and yeah, I think yeah, yeah. the way we invest in real estate is so boring that I don't think there's ever been a show about multifamily buy and hold real estate investing. Like it just sounds boring, you know, <laughs> even though it's mm-hmm. something that we just absolutely love. Um HGTV is full of shows about flipping. Let's let's mm. be honest. We've all wanted to be a flipper at some point in time. We've seen the episodes or we've had to sit beside our wife while they watch the episodes. I mean, minus the fact- whole work part of it though, right? Matt? <laughs> like I, I want to be a flipper. I just don't want to do any of that work. And as you said, we've done them in the company. Uh, there was a point in life where, where Leslie, where my wife and I had actually moved uh, six times in eight years. So we'd actually flipped those houses. It got to the point and Leslie really blew up on, on Instagram. We actually had a TV show pilot filmed about us that at first we were going to call for never home because we didn't stay in these forever homes very long. And then they wanted to <laughs> rebrand as, as the big family flip, which I hated the name of. And we kept saying, we're not flippers. We're not flippers. But here's, here's <laughs> the primary difference we should know for our listeners. If you plan to live in the house and it's something you're renovating, that's different. We're talking about people who are flipping as an investment strategy. So let's let's uh, differentiate, you know, right. right off the hop there. This is this is about being an investment strategy. And I literally got a call today from a client who bought a flip back in December on the water, dreams of flipping this thing, needed a lot of work. He called me today and he said, "Matt, I'm in over my head." conservation authority had come in they they apparently he didn't pull permits so he's got a stop work order he's put a ton of dough into this thing he's encountered challenges he didn't anticipate and he sounded like he was in a desperate state of mind so of course tried to talk him down and talk him through and troubleshoot and problem solve a little bit but i i I felt his pain because we have been there ourselves Mm -hmm. and uh you know today we're going to explore some of the challenges that we've experienced with our past flips as part of bringing awareness to to, so that if you decide to become a flipper and certainly we'll talk about some people that maybe flips are great for Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you can at least proactively address some of these challenges and variables so this doesn't become the unraveling sweater that i was uh dealing with this morning with with this poor client who's now awfully stressed out uh, yeah, absolutely. And and that's just one example, Matt. And I'm so happy that you, uh, you know, differentiated between what you and Leslie were doing. Like you were like, really, the work that you and Leslie did was, of course, you were like, hey, we're hoping that there will be a profit at the end. But ultimately, you loved the process, like especially mm-hmm. Leslie, like mm-hmm. knowing Leslie, if you ever have the pleasure of meeting Leslie, those who are listening, you will see someone who is so artistically creative and has so many amazing ideas. Ideas. Sometimes even just how she describes certain things, I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm sure it's beautiful. <laughs> you know, I, like yeah. 
like it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and the work that you know both of you have done, uh, and I, I believe we chatted about in one of the early episodes. Uh, so check out at Le- the Leslie Style on Instagram. You'll get to see all of that awesomeness. Amazing. But your like number one goal there was almost, I would argue, like to almost up yourself and we'll call it like ladder climb from like one property to the next to the next where you're adding in sweat equity. You're adding in obviously investment of time and energy and, and you know, the the cost of, of the products you need to put in there and the, the construction you need to put in there. But ultimately, it's like you're building this equity in these properties and you use that and you sort of like, it wasn't like you were just going from this property that's worth this amount to something worth the same amount. It's like each time you got to climb a bit, climb a bit, climb a bit. Mm-hmm. Such mm-hmm. a cool and awesome strategy especially if in your mind you're going, I love this house and how it turned out right. so much that I could see myself staying here, right? And and I think that was always in the back of your minds. I know that that's not who you are as people. Like you enjoy the moving and the, the newness. The designing. But ultimately, if the market went against you and it was like, shoot, we can't sell this thing for a profit, you would have been like, all right, I guess we're staying here, right? Current mortgage mm-hmm. as is, mm-hmm. here we are and, and we're ready to go. Whereas when we look on the other other hand everything on you know when they say the big flip i love it because you're bigly and you know the big flip i like that part <laughs> it had a ring but it they had a needed ring. that word flip in there because people love the idea the idea of a flip in general is that essentially it's like as close to getting rich quick in real estate as you possibly can but the problem is is that all the work and especially when you watch a 30 minute episode and they're only what 22 minutes with commercials right when you take the commercials out you got 22 minutes to see this massive trans- uh, transformation typically with uh, all kinds of donated materials <laughs> all kinds of you know what i mean best pricing the contractors are great and, and everything timely. lines up yeah everything lines up perfectly we have not at least when it comes to and i'm going to argue matt you can confirm or deny this we have not had it that smooth even in your own homes that you've done in terms of it just being like quick, perfect, not that expensive. Like it always seems to blow up and we've had that same experience. And, you know, one thing I do want to sort of uh, address is, John, you said why we will never do a flip again. And I will never say never because every time we end up in this situation where we're in the next flip like we are right now is because the opportunity felt really awesome and we still end up not enjoying it at the end. So imagine people who rush into it, right? If you're new and you're listening to this and you're going, wow, I want to get into real estate. It's like, if you're thinking flips as your first you know, opportunity or bet, just make sure that you know what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. You, you probably want to be handy and you've got to have some patience and you also have to have capital. Uh, and just know that the market is changing. Like the market has changed. And and for a lot of people, just like that person who called you this morning, Matt, that person about a year, maybe 18 months ago, I bet you you don't get that call because no matter how long, how expensive, the market was just booming to the point where it was mm. like you could have done anything as slowly as possible and still probably could have turned a profit, but it wasn't because you were good at what you were doing. It was just because the market <clears throat> conditions supported it. Whereas now we're in this position where, hey, if the budget doesn't line up, if the timing doesn't line up, and guess what? If the quality isn't there, you are dealing with some problems. Yeah, and, yeah, and I, I think... think- Okay, go ahead, man. And I think when we think about flipping the average person, um, the the average person, when they think about real estate, is, this is my guess. And, and maybe this is because this is the way I thought about real estate uh, and getting into real estate was that was that flipping was the way to go. And maybe it was TV. Maybe it's the fact that you don't immediately think that you have to deal with renters. Like, you, like renting for me initially wasn't a thing because like, look, you can buy a house. You can you can pay a contractor to fix it up and then you can sell a house and you're supposed to turn a profit like that does sound pretty awesome because it's short term. You know, you're going to get your money and then you can put it somewhere else. Um, You don't have to deal with any renters going like I didn't pay on time or you wreck something like I know there's a lot of like things that draw people to this. And that's probably why they make TV shows about it, too, and and why I think the, the the population 
thinks about flipping at this time now versus the slow, the, the, this more, a little bit more, you know, the more secure way of, of real, uh, of rental, um, is, is that you don't have to deal with all these other hassles, right? There's a different set of hassles that we've talked about since the inception of this podcast of how we can mitigate those, those hassles on the real estate uh, investment rental side of things versus, Hey, I can buy a house and then, and then turn around and sell it. So, so guys, tell me what are some of these, like these, like Kyle, you kind of mentioned about the market timing. Is that all that Matt? Is that all that's like preventing this? Because it's like, look, I can, I can buy a house. uh, If the market, doesn't you know keep going up yeah i might not be able to sell it so i might sell it as a loss what are my like that does that doesn't sound great but is that the only <laughs> thing that we should be thinking about when we're we're kind of getting into flipping or what are some of the other horror stories or or reasons that you're saying no yeah john i think kyle addressed some of the variables and maybe we can tease them out a, l- a little bit further here and I, mm-hmm. like part of this comes back to your whole reason for investing in the first place for us it's been a passive second source of income it's not mm-hmm. our primary source of income we're none of us are contractors i used to try to get very involved in the in the uh, construction part of things but i've learned i'm better with a phone than a hammer that's where my strength lies mm-hmm. and so one of the variables kyle talked about was the market and listen none of us have any control over the market market is consistently fluid it's going up it's going down and we can't ever be confidently pin our hopes and our expectations on where the market's going to be at any given time listen last year we had essentially eight different markets because the interest rates were hiked eight times and with each hike we had a new real estate market so it's very very fluid and it can be incredibly inconsistent despite having you know years of record growth recently we had a very very a tumultuous last year and a lot of people got caught in that in that market variability one of the other variables is our timelines listen i'm literally closing i sold a flip Yes, I know. I did one. I did one. Despite here I am beating them up. I did one that I purchased back in May of this year. It, it I got it for a great price. I knew enough to hire a professional contractor with a contract. While it was supposed to be three months that flip was supposed to take, it ended up taking over six. So we had that variability mm-hmm. of the timeline. Even with a pro in place, they just encounter things. We call it the unraveling sweater with renovations because once right. you start to take things apart, you just don't know what you're going to find. So contractor delays are a huge variable. Uh, sometimes material delays in those timelines can be a, can be a variable mm. as well. Another major variable, the contractors themselves. Mm. Oh my goodness. I have certainly dealt with my fair share of them. I have incredible respect for what they know how to do and with renovations, especially what they know how to fix and problem solve. But, you know, when we talk as teachers about, you know, maybe who different sort of students are and what pathways they end up taking in life, you know, sometimes those that have gone into the trades, at least in my experience as a, you know, as a guidance counselor, are those that didn't necessarily feel drawn towards those more academic university type type pathways, which sometimes meant, and maybe I'm extrapolating too much here, but that sometimes meant that they weren't always the most organized or timely or those type of things that those skills that maybe came later in life and learned on the job. Well, these people are now our, you know, HVAC technicians, our electricians, our plumbers, all amazing career pathways because the money they make is incredible. But as adults, sometimes these skills are still in progress. So contractors are notoriously challenging uh, to get a hold of, to hold accountable, uh, you know, and, and, and to, to meet deadlines. So the contractor variables for sure. Costs is another major variable. Also, you're going to have a budget when you start, but inevitably there's going to be cost overruns because again, that unraveling sweater as it comes apart, you don't know what you're going to find. You don't even know about material prices, just like with the housing market, you know, the lumber market, some of those raw materials, um, some of those things you need to finish off your house, like the costs have gone, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. doubled and tripled over the course of the pandemic. So I think the cost variable is, is really difficult as well. And then there's just the unknown variables like these guys are calling me today. It sounded like they didn't even think they should have pulled permits you know and 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 they got busted and so they didn't even know what they they didn't know which you know for them was a was Mm -hmm. a variable that they they couldn't control and of course with experience and time and and the right team like you can control as many of these variables as possible but in the case of this property that i'm selling this week i bought it for a great price i hired a pro it turned out awesome and i think at the end of this i'm going to walk away with an eight thousand dollar profit 
So I've tied up hundreds of thousands of dollars of my money in this house. I uh, How many had to years work... of your life have you lost? <laughs> Just and again, curiosity. I tried to organize this one in the best way possible. Like, I'm not doing any of the so, work. It's going to be a pro. going to be really hands off. So tied up all that money, all that time and effort. And at times, at times, stress and frustration, chasing mm-hmm. chasing the contractor, uh, and putting it up for mark, uh, on the market, realizing even as a realtor, our expectations weren't going to be met based on the market feedback. We eventually sold it. I'm happy that we sold it. We talked about converting it into a rental instead. I'm happy to let it go. But for $8,000, right. I could have made more money with other investments. Well, I was just mm. going to say that, Matt. Like if you put that 8000 in terms of rental income or or your your... your... I guess, I guess return on investment with a rental property. You know, we talked about the three silver bullets of, you know, real estate, uh, rental and rental investing and, and thinking about, you know, appreciation, mortgage pay down and the cash flow. Matt, what would you say? Like if you looked at the $8,000 that you made in profit on this deal, like how does that translate and compare to say one or two of your rental properties that uh, that you've had in the past on you know the gain that you get per year on on that oh like like infinitesimal dismal like like awful because you know with flips you're only able to use one of those silver bullets and and in this case it's not passive appreciation you're actively you're forcing the appreciation of the property that's what a flip is so right. you're using that appreciation silver bullet it's the only one because mm-hmm. there's no cash flow obviously and mm-hmm. uh and there's no mortgage pay down in this case actually we we paid cash for the property so you know you guys are the math guys so let's say that uh my my cost and this my total costs on on this property I would have put out I had a partner on this property, so I would have put out something like two hundred and ten thousand dollars over the course mm. of those six months. I made an eight thousand dollar return, um, some of which I'll end up having some tax implications for mm-hmm, as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, you guys tell me what's the rate of return, and and you know, uh, we could certainly have done that, <laughs> or I know that implicitly yeah. without even knowing the you know what the percentage yeah. is. We're we're going to use some proportional reasoning here Uh-oh. and go. Okay, well, eight thousand of a hundred thousands, eight percent, and then you know you've doubled that to two hundred or over two hundred. So you're looking at like less than four percent because you're going to double, double the lo- amount, half the rate, and then all of a sudden you're like, but but now we haven't annualized that. Right. I was going right? to say like that's for how long. But six I would months? argue, though, so if it was six months, then now we double could it. double the rate right. and say it's eight. So let's say you earned about 8% on all that money. However, I'm going to argue that 8% for the amount of risk, uh, stress, um, work, right? If you take those hours that you worked on that deal, whereas if I look at it and I go, okay, I've got a long-term rental. And let's just say I'm just... Pull in numbers out of the air here. Let's say it's a $1,500 mortgage on this long-term rental. And okay, so we take that $1,500. In the early years, if it's say amortized over 25 years, in the early years, you're paying more interest than principal. So if let's say we adjust down, we say it's, ah, let's just say $600 is how much you are paying down in principal. So less than half of that mortgage amount and we do that for 12 months, or we'll do it for six months. For six months, the mortgage pay down alone is $3,600, and all you had to do was let the bank accept the money on behalf of the renter. Oh, wait, we didn't count your cash flow, right? Because we didn't buy the property without cash flow. Oh, wait, we didn't account the potential appreciation. And really, all you needed to do was make sure that the rent came in, which there's a risk there. They might not pay. We've had that happen too, but that is at least a much, le- there's so many fewer variables in <clears throat> our opinion. Mm. However, if you're listening to this and you're going, these guys don't know what they're talking about, like flipping's where it's at, then you're probably not even listening to this podcast anyway, because we don't really like, we're, we're kind of like trying to get people who are trying to get in uh, early in, or on the first um, investment, or they're trying to figure out like what to do with their money in order to create that wealth. If you're already like on that flipping path, you probably haven't made it to episode, what is this, 15? Like you're probably gone. You're like, these guys are too slow and boring for me. These guys are too conservative or too safe for me. And that's totally fine. But if you want to go the other way, 
I just want to go back to what you said about, um, um, John, you were saying just about like, how do we, like, how do we try to ensure that we're like prepared for, you know, some of these like swings on a flip. And if you just think of all of the, the variability on all of the decisions that have to be made, there's like picture here. If you're watching on YouTube, I've got my hands separated. If, if there's like, if it could cost this low or go up this high. And if you just think that on any string of five or 10 items, you hit on that top end of your range, like your budget has now blown up way more than maybe you've you've anticipated. Most people look at that range and they say, okay, well, an HVAC system is going to cost me about blank. When they say about, they tend to pick an average. So they're picking somewhere in the middle. But hey, when all of a sudden lumber prices go up, the cost of, you know, even like, you know, screws and nails and other things are going like everything's going up, hmm. labor's going up. All of a sudden now it's like, whoa, we're actually above that range that we originally anticipated. And oh my gosh, the market has shifted. And now people, it's taking longer to sell property. So now my holding costs are going to go up. Hmm. So this isn't to scare people. It's to make sure that if that is like, if you're still nodding your head and you're like, oh my God, I can't wait to dig into my, you know, into a flip. I love it. I'm thriving to do this. Then awesome. Just make sure that you are aware of all of the uncertainty that can go along with it. And the people who are going to take those variables and they're going to account for those variables and do it well, those are the people that are going to be super successful and they can earn a lot of money. It's just, we just know it's not us. I know it's not me anyway. I'm like, I just don't want to do that work. It's just doesn't suit me. I don't sleep as well at night and I would just much rather do something that I know in the long run, doesn't matter what the market does short term, long run, we know real estate's going to be a okay. So I want to make sure that we get into properties that are high quality, have cash flow. And no matter what happens, as long as we can pay those bills, we are going to be good to go. You know, so you bring up an uh, interesting kind of counter argument here, Kyle. Uh, so, so when people, when we talk about you know real estate uh, investing with rentals, uh, and all the episodes that uh, led up to this particular episode, um, we talked about you know budgeting for these items, budgeting for you know um, vacancy, budgeting for uh, um, you know, fixing up properties and capital expenditures. Like we talked about all the nuts and bolts of, of making sure the numbers worked. And when you think about the list and when we, in a few episodes ago, we shared our spreadsheet on how to, how to analyze a deal. And we said we would not get into a, a, a rental deal unless the numbers numbers came out real nice we so go back and listen to that episode. Um, if, if you are unsure of what we're talking about, but, but so that's a long list. And then what you ju you just said is like there are a lot more variables. Is that is that what I'm hearing right now? Like the variables are there's more variables to consider here than than rental, because it sounds like there's a lot with with rental and what can go wrong with 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 a rental uh, unit. And and you're just I think what I'm hearing you say is like there are things that can go wrong there but we've budgeted for them. Now we're budgeting for our flip as well, but you're saying there's a lot more variability in what can happen? Yeah, I, John, I think that there that, that there is more variability. I, I think that this is about knowing yourself and deciding the right investment strategy for mm -hmm. yourself as well. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective as teachers, from our audience's perspective of professionals who likely have uh, day jobs already and are doing investing on the side, the flipping part doesn't work. As alluring as it seems, right. as sexy as it looks on TV, it just doesn't work. You know, another variability is when you're looking at single family homes, you're dealing in the most competitive real estate marketplace as well in terms of trying to find the deal. And you know, one of the common sayings is make your money on the buy. So in other words, you need to buy as cheaply as possible. Like that flip I talked about making $8,000 on, I bought it for $225,000. You'd be hard pressed to find a cheaper house in our real estate marketplace than what I bought that for. And yet, you know, fast forward to the end of the flip, I'm still barely turning a profit on it. Mm -hmm. Now, it might have been an interesting case study had we turned that into a rental, but at the end of the day, it just didn't fit my in primary investment strategy, which is multifamily rentals, you know, buying right. and holding uh, those. So I think that 
this is largely about knowing yourself. If you're someone who is um, uh, looking to be the active partner in, in a project, you want to be hands-on. Maybe you're handy. Maybe you're a contractor. Maybe you don't have the capital, but you have the know-how and the time and the energy. Well, then doing these flips can be great. People love them because they're big chunks of cash they, or they can be, can be a big influx of cash if you do well. So I get the allure. I get even people who want to do them, but I would even argue for those people that are able to do the flips, I think that they're better off looking for multifamily properties. They can renovate them themselves if they want. Um, and live over the long maybe. term, you know, live in once your house hack. So live in one and rent the other. Um, for me, my investment uh, horizon is long term. I don't need to make this money today, next week, next month, or even this year. I want to make it continuously over a long period of time. And that is the investing strategy that we advocate for and that we are using. And I recognize that might not make sense for everyone, but for us, it certainly does. And I think largely for our audience, it does as well. I love it. I love it. No, that's so true. And, and I think you nailed it, Matt. It's like if you are eager to be actively involved, which means on the phone a lot, probably every day, like visiting every day, like if that is you, awesome. Like, you know, we're not saying you cannot make money in there. You can. We can't because we will not do that. <laughs> you know, we won't do it well enough. So that's why it doesn't work for us. The other thing I think is um, important for, for people to know, too is that if you're gonna be successful flipping a property, you have to also think about all of the work and the effort that has to go into your system of finding properties, right? So I mean, that means like you're knocking on doors, right? You're dropping flyers, like you're doing bandit signs, like you're doing, like you have to do a lot of prospecting in order to find properties that haven't hit the MLS typically. Right. Now, I say typically because over the past couple of years, you could still potentially pull a property off the MLS and maybe flip it if you were quick enough because the market kept going up so dramatically. But again, that's not routine. That's not typical. And therefore, that's not really a strategy that we really wanted to commit too much energy or time into. So if you're up for that and finding properties that are significantly below the market value, then there's a potential. But just like you said, Matt, like your property that you picked up was well below market value. And on paper, it seemed as though there was a massive property or like profit to be had. And maybe, maybe you could have got a better profit if you, Matt, yourself went out and priced everything and literally went out and got every sub trade and you, you know, subcontracted the whole thing. It maybe you could have got more profit, but that was not your initial intent. John and I right now are in on a property and it's like, it's, it's like the flip from hell, you know, like it's just, <laughs> it, it, you know, the, the, the agreement we're in and, and so forth with the contractor that we're working with who will remain nameless because I want them to finish the job. But if they don't finish <laughs> the job, I'm going to, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but you know, this person is taking for, Ever to do everything. And I know the person does quality work. Um, but you know, it reminds me, Matt, a long time ago you had you had mentioned something. It was the first time I ever heard it. It was called the Iron Triangle, and you shared it with me. And I was like, Yeah, I guess that makes sense. It was this idea, I think it was Dr. Martin Barnes in 1969 was sort of the the first person to to sort of articulate this idea that there are three different constraints uh, that are kind of tugging on each other. And it works really well when it comes into projects and managing projects. And that's that you can do things cheaply, you can do them good, or you can do them fast. And it's hard to do all three really well. So it's like, if you want it really fast, you're probably giving up some quality, you're giving up some cost or some savings because the person who does it fast is probably gonna demand more cost uh, or, or a higher cost in order to do it. And the opposite's true too. You can maybe do it cheaply, but guess what? Maybe the quality now goes down uh, and you know maybe it's still fast because it's cheap, but now quality's right. gone. And two it seems like you, know, you can get the two out of the three of those things. Right now, John, I would argue that the iron triangle is not working for us because I feel like we're getting none of those three things. Well, we must be getting good. We, we must be getting good, right? Like, yeah, I so, hope, I hope so, we're getting good. So it's good. not cheap. <laughs> 
here. It's not cheap right now, and it's not fast. So we must, by by default, we must be getting the good. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, th and this is actually a good a good example to to chat about. Um, in 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 case, like, let's say you said earlier that. Will you know never say never because it's possible that we're in this situation again. But maybe maybe you want to share the strategy that we took uh, to help kind of step into this deal. Um, yeah. That that uh, that can actually like we didn't want to flip, but it's like you know what we're gonna take this particular strategy in this flip so that we can weigh our uh, kind of like think about our risk factor and go look if this happens this is what we're going to do if this happens this is what we're going to do because yeah. i think we're in a unique situation here with this flip i i feel like this could potentially be its own episode but we're going <laughs> to dig into it because it's worthwhile uh, originally just to kind of frame this for everyone this actually wasn't introduced to us as a flip opportunity this person this the actual contractor in this case actually approached us and wanted us to lend privately to them. And ironically, we just had a potential joint venture uh, call last night with a potential joint venture who wants to uh, you know, be involved in any of our future deals. We had a great call last night and this person was talking about lending money privately and we discussed some of the pros and the cons of it. Uh, lending privately, unless it's arranged very well and secured against property and all of these details, which cost more money and therefore happen less often is something that, um, you know, we typically don't do a whole lot of. So with this particular person, I said, listen, instead, what we'll do is we will buy the property. We will take ownership and be, put our name on the property and we will have a trust agreement that cuts you into the deal where we will only take private money at the end, not benefit from the flip profit. So it was a very creative strategy, but really the only reason why we did it was because we're like, hmm, we would like to earn private money, but we do not want to have the risk of having to go try to get money. I, I don't know anyone out there, hopefully it, it never happens. It's never happened to us yet, but you should probably think about what would happen if, if let's say you lend money privately to someone and they owe money to a lot of other people and they have no more money to give you. You can take them to court, you can do all you want, but if they don't have money to give you, who's giving it to you? And the answer is no nobody. nobody. So for us, we were like, hey, worst case scenario on this particular deal, we the person would walk and we own this property. So really in our minds, even though it's a flip in that person's mind, this is kind of like private lending with the safety net of at the end of the day, we will get this property in whatever condition. It might be an unfinished condition, for example, if right. that person was just to walk away, but at least we have it. And if you go all the way back to the early episodes, my number one reason for entering real estate was so I could physically go and like knock on the door of the investment, knowing it is mine. Even if right now it's not in the best condition or if I, you know, maybe, maybe I can't even sell it to, you know, break even at this point, what we could do is we could go finish this work and then guess what? Just like Matt has said earlier about his property, we could rent it and just, you know, keep it going. Is it ideal? Is that what we want to happen? No, but we wanted to make sure that we covered our but on this particular deal so that we're not running around having to sue people, having to, you know, how are we going to get our money back, blah, blah, blah. At the end of the day, we're going to have a property. And even though it's annoying, it's, you know, not necessarily what we want. At least we walk out with an asset that can still produce us some cash flow. Yeah, and I think I think we're uh, we're in a safer position that way compared to uh, the private money that you had just described. And I think people who are flipping are are probably buying their properties, flipping them, and then reselling them. But the question I might be like Kyle, if, if the market turns, what are you going to do with that property? Have you thought about what will you do if? blank happens right like i think that's an important lesson to think about uh and plan for like if if the market drops and you can't sell it for a profit are you prepared to turn around and rent it out like maybe that's because that was going to be our plan right like we might take this thing and rent this thing out if it if uh it doesn't complete in the appropriate amount of time for everybody to earn money on this so so I think when you're you're doing your flip you you definitely want to think about these these downsides and upsides but 
Let's uh, let's start summarizing here, guys, because I think we've tried to make a case here for why we don't want to flip, even though we're involved in some flips and we may be involved <laughs> in flips in the future. Uh, yeah. But we don't want to be. We don't want to be because it sounds like there are a lot of variables that are that we don't want to plan for. And I think that like going back to I think Matt's Matt's big idea here is that what kind of investor do you want to be? And we want to be a very hands off type investor. And so therefore, when those variables change and those variables happen on the rental side of things, we're OK with that because we've already planned for we've got a system in place that deals with all those variables so that we're still we're still very passive. But on this side, it, it's harder because they're so short term to get that system in place to deal with those variables. Those variables are going to change and we're going to have to be more hands on. And that's not who we want to be. And I think we've kind of articulated here and hopefully made a case here that we can get better returns on the rental side of things than the flipping side of things for us, for us and for a long term strategy. It, it cracks me up that we've just spent, you know, 30, 40 minutes talking about all the reasons why we shouldn't flip. And yet we are all currently <laughs> involved in flips. And I speak, I think that speaks to just the opportunity mindset with investing. You know, and you've got to be open minded, you've got to be pragmatic, you've got to be fluid. So even though we don't like them, we're involved in them currently. We're <laughs> we'll probably be involved in another one. But this is really all about, you know, controlling our risk, controlling our variables. And, and we do that through multifamily long term investing. And, and so, you know, my big takeaways here is that, that it's, it's certainly right for some people. But I think that group is a small number of people. And that I think by and large, the best long term success, the best generational wealth building is to be found in our predominant strategy you know, multifamily investing. There's some great stories from flips uh, and there can be some uh, fantastic learning to come out of it. Mm -hmm. But much of that learning is done on the failure side yeah. when it comes time to flips, at least in, in our realm of experience. I, I was going to just say exactly that. I think my big takeaway is that, guess what? When you're doing what you're doing, those people who are listening right now, even if you're new to, hey, I want to start investing and I, you know, maybe it's real estate, maybe it's something else, maybe it's flips, maybe it's long term. At the end of the day, you may not know what the right fit is for you until you do it and realize that it's not for you. And then maybe like us, you might do it five or six more times and then realize it's not for you. And then who knows, like six months from now, we might find ourselves back in there again, just to just take one final blow, one final black eye to say, <laughs> wow, we should not have done that. So uh, just keep in mind, you know, again, cover your bases as best you can. You can't do things perfectly, but what you can do is you can always look at every opportunity as that, even if it's a failure, look at it as an opportunity to learn, to, to kind of grow from it and to decide like what's going to help me get closer to my goal that personal belief there that you know Don Campbell talks about and and Matt so uh so um you know handily has has brought me towards in in thinking about that's something that I hope you take from this podcast. So uh, friends, if you haven't yet, if you found this episode or other episodes helpful, you don't know how helpful it is to leave a five-star rating and review. And hey, remember, you won't know how that feels until you do it. And I promise you, it's not gonna be a mistake like taking on our next flip. So head over, leave a five-star rating and review and uh, do us a solid and share it with your friends and family. All links, resources, and transcripts from the episode can be found over on our website, investedteacher.com forward slash episode 15. Again, that's investedteacher.com forward slash episode 15. Earlier in the episode, Kyle mentioned that uh, we had a chat with uh, one of you uh, who had listened to the episode and reached out to us uh, for potential JV partners uh, to go in our next deal. And uh, if you are looking to get started in real estate and not sure you want to do this alone, you want partners who have done this before, um, reach out to us. We would love to partner with you uh, and talk about it with you to see if, hey, you're the right fit. So all you have to do is head on over to investedteacher.com forward slash JV. That's investedteacher.com forward slash JV. Fill out a short, uh, a, a short uh, form and uh, you'll be on our list for our next deal. Well then, my friends, invested students, I think it's that time for class dismissed.
This is a reminder that this content is for informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice.